now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the new mayor of the city of Glendale, two, two days into the job, uh, but uh, it's Jerry Wires, of course, and uh, Mayor Wires has an extensive uh, service to the West Valley and to the city of Glendale, uh, as well as the state. Uh, he has served four full terms in the Arizona State Legislature. During his tenure as a state representative, he chaired the National Resources Committee as well as the Military Affairs and Public Safety Committees. And finally, during his last two years, he was the chairman of the Rules Committee. Uh, Mayor Wires also served Arizona on the National Conference of State Legislatures Military Sustainability Task Force. He helped lead efforts to bring the F-35 here to Luke Air Force Base, solidifying this critical economic engine for the city of Glendale. Mayor Wires has a long and impressive record as well of community service and has won recognition for his work on behalf of sportsmen, motorcyclists, and military veterans group, just to name a few. He moved to Arizona in 1966. He and his wife, Sandy, have been married for more than 30 years, have one daughter, and in December became grandparents for the first time. Congratulations. Jerry's an accomplished pilot as well as a member of the Civil Air Patrol with over two decades of flying experience. He owns a hangar and flies out of his home base of Glendale Airport. So, Mayor Wires, please come up. We'd love to have you. Welcome. Well, good evening, or good afternoon, I guess it is. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Glendale. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the introduction as Westmart's president and CEO. Uh, she, uh, uh, Ms. Ryder, has done a fantastic job elevating this organization and getting all of us focused on our top priorities of promoting the West Valley and enhancing our economic development in this region. If you haven't seen the fantastic materials uh, that uh, Michelle and her staff have been producing, including a very impressive, this very impressive West Valley asset and inventory, and there's a map inside here, uh, brochure, you need to get your hands on one of these. Uh, they're great resources to promote the West Valley in very, very impressive fashion. One of the original Westmark traditions that we all look forward to every year is, is this annual West Valley State of the Luncheon, co-hosted by the West Valley Chamber of Commerce Alliance. Uh, as the new mayor of, of Glendale, and this is my first official act, so bear with me, uh, on behalf of the city of Glendale, I want to welcome all of you and say how delighted we are once again to host this significant event and to hear directly from our governor, Brewer, on the matters that are most important to all of us. We're always pleased to host the governor of Arizona, but we've had added a special honor these last four years of hosting the governor, we proudly claim as a Glendale resident. Jen Brewer, Governor Brewer, is a battle-tested leader who has led our state through challenging times. She's also been a good friend of the city of Glendale and the residents of the West Valley. I could spend a lot of time telling you personal stories of the Governor Brewer's leadership and successes throughout the years, but the honor of the introduction of, of introducing Governor Brewer goes rightfully to our program platinum sponsor, which is CenturyLink. Representing CenturyLink is Jeff Lindsay, uh, Vice President of the Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for Glendale, I'm sorry, for CenturyLink Southwest Region. Jeff leads the team responsibility for the state and local government affairs and regulatory affairs in Arizona, New Mexico, and in Nevada. Prior to his current assignment, he was a director of the Federal Public Policy for CenturyLink based in Overland Park, Kansas. His responsibilities included managing intercarrier compensation and universal service policy and harmonizing CenturyLink's policy positions at federal and state levels. Jeff holds an MBA in finance from the University of Kansas and an ABS in accounting from Ball State University. He's also a certified public accountant and he also performed graduate work in political science at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. If all of you would please join me in welcoming Jeff Lindsay. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction, those warm words. Uh, this is a, a, a first for me as well and a recent uh, transplant to the state and uh, certainly have uh, enjoyed the, the experience here. Uh, I'm honored uh, by the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Governor Brewer 
and uh, certainly uh, we will uh, commence once I uh, put my uh, cheaters on here. So, um, we are very pleased and honored to have Governor Jan Brewer here with us today to welcome us into the 51st uh, Arizona Legislative Session. On January uh, 21st, 2009, uh, she took the oath of office to become Arizona's 22nd governor, taking immediate steps to bring Arizona back from the brink of economic collapse. Governor Brewer's first act was to issue a moratorium on new regulations. She then implemented the four cornerstones of reform, her comprehensive plan to steer Arizona into a prosperous and secure future. And since then, she's worked diligently to fulfill the priorities most critical to the state of Arizona. She has positioned the state as one of the most business friendly in the nation. As governor of a state that is a gateway for legal immigration, she has fought to secure our southern border and protect our citizens. She has implemented education reforms that will prepare our students to meet the ever-challenging demands of employers and to compete on a global scale. She has signed measures to shrink state government, to reform our personnel system, system to, to the challenging uh, demands and mirror the private sector and attract business investment. Indeed, she's made tough decisions always with the best interests of Arizona at heart. So without further ado, please help me welcome a true champion of Arizona, of our Constitution, of our children, of our families, our businesses, and the men and women who serve us, uh, who serve to protect our nation here and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, here to set the stage for a productive and successful 51st state legislature, please welcome the Honorable Janice K. Brewer, Governor of the State of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, it is so great to be here in the West Valley. Uh, the sun always seems to shine just a little bit brighter over here, doesn't it? We got a west side. I would like to thank, uh, oh, thank you. I would like to thank um, Westmark for hosting this luncheon today. I have always thoroughly enjoyed our partnership over the years as we have tackled major policy reforms together. And I have very fond memories of my time on the Westmark Executive Committee. And as an honorary member, I continue to keep my eye on all of you. So, The 15 communities that make up the West Valley create a region that is geographically, demographically, and politically diverse. The West Valley cities have made great strides in the recent years to work diligently and collectively. And because of those efforts, this region has enjoyed so many notable accomplishments. We need to continue down this path to ensure economic development and a prosperity. We have just celebrated all of the achievements of Arizona's first 100 years. And we were reminded of Arizona's five C's, copper, cattle, cotton, citrus, and climate. I am here to tell you that our second century will hinge on another C, competition. Today, Arizona must compete for the most desirable jobs for our citizens, the finest teachers in our schools, the most talented students and faculties in our universities. And each of our citizens must likewise compete to earn a living, build a future, and raise a family in a safe and healthy environment. They face threats that once did not exist. And Arizona leaders had better make sure we are helping them, not hurting them in their efforts. Together, we've made great strides in the last four years to improve Arizona's competitive position. We faced the hardest of times, but sustained and strengthened state government through the downturn. Per capita, Arizona has the second lowest number of state employees of all states. We reformed our personnel system, so citizens will have a state workforce motivated by performance and accountability. We passed meaningful reforms to improve our education system and expanded school choice. 
we limited regulations and enacted the largest and most strategic tax cuts in state history, unlike our friends in Washington, D.C. And we even accomplished something novel and rare in politics. We kept our word. In 2010, we asked the people to increase their own taxes and promised them it would be temporary. That promise will be kept when the Proposition 100 sales tax expires in May. Not long ago, we were facing the worst housing collapse in our history. The downturn had cost us more than 300,000 jobs, and our state government was bogged down by a $3 billion deficit. Now, our housing market is on the mend, recovering faster in Metro Phoenix than anywhere in America. We're adding jobs at the swiftest clips in years, nearly 23,000 in November alone. In fact, Arizona ranked fifth in the nation for job growth during 2012. The Kauffman Index recently declared Arizona the country's premier place for entrepreneurs. Our budget is now balanced and we've set aside $450 million in the state's rainy day fund for the next time crisis strikes. And crime and violence in Arizona continues to trend downward. Arizonans have reduced crimes by punishing criminals and not by infringing on the rights of law-abiding gun owners. Yes, our state, is get, our state is getting stronger, and I am confident that Arizona's light of opportunity will shine as bright as the Arizona sun in the years to come. Leaders of this state can have no higher priority than the safety of children in state care. That's why in 2011, I convened a child safety task force to improve the way in which the state oversees children under its care and investigates cases of abuse and neglect. Many of that panel's recommendations have now been adopted, including the creation of a special unit of law enforcement veterans focused on investigating the worst cases of child abuse and neglect. We've improved operation at Child Protective Services by overhauling the hotline system so the most urgent calls are directed for faster response, by streamlining the hiring process to ensure every available caseworker position is filled, and by cutting paperwork burdens so caseworkers spend more time checking up on children. Despite these efforts, there can be no doubt our system of child safety is under pressure. Arizona's abused and neglected children need help. The executive budget I released Friday will add 150 CPS caseworkers and boost foster care, adoption services, and emergency placement of children needing rescue. Because these needs can't wait, I've asked lawmakers to join me in approving an emergency budget request to hire 50 additional caseworkers right now. We cannot strike evil from the hearts of those who would harm an innocent child. But these common sense steps will help at-risk children get the assistance they need before it's too late. These past four years, we have tackled hard questions and faced moral challenges. My friends, this too is a moral issue, and Arizona must protect her children. There is no limit to what we can accomplish when we work in cooperation toward a common goal. Just look at Arizona's economic and fiscal turnaround. It's no surprise that we in Arizona have created a model of recovery very different from that pursued by the administration in Washington, D.C. Where they've spent, we've saved. Where they've hampered private industry with excessive rules and regulations, we've marshaled the power 
of the free market. We did this because we know, as President Reagan once said, and I quote, no power of government is as formidable a force for good as the creativity and entrepreneurial drive of the American people, end of quote. In the new economy, talent is king. Creativity is the new capital, and competition is worldwide. The Arizona Commerce Authority will continue to lead our job attraction efforts. World-class employers like Intel, Amazon, Silicon Valley Bank have chosen to locate or expand in Arizona, due in part to the fine work of the ACA and the robust business environment we provide. Halfway through this fiscal year, the Commerce Authority has already helped deliver more than $600 million in capital investment and 6,000 jobs. Over the next decade, the West Valley will be the center of growth. More than half of the Phoenix area's future growth is expected to occur in the West Valley. New transportation corridors such as the Loop 303 and the future I-11 will further position the region for quality economic growth. We have also witnessed growth opportunities in this region within our industries of focus. With available land and an attractive workforce, the West Valley has seen recent wins like Sub-Zero Incorporation and Rio Glass, which employ hundreds of people and have made millions of dollars of investment in the region. Existing corporate citizens like Sun Health, upcoming expansions from Banner Health, Dignity Health, Phoenix Children Hospital will serve the booming populations and promote supply chain activity. While we lower the barriers to business growth, keeping regulations lean and taxes competitive, it's clear we have another problem, our own sales tax system. Sales tax is the most critical source of revenue for core state programs, but our sales tax code is one of the most complicated in the nation. It's an accountant's dream, but a business owner's nightmare. Arizona's local and state governments have created a tax system with so many twists and turns that we make it difficult for businesses to simply pay what they owe. For business owners serving customers in multiple cities with multiple license requirements, multiple tax returns, multiple tax bases, and multiple audits, compliance can be nearly impossible. That's why I formed a special task force of business owners and tax experts to ask them to offer recommendations on ways we could simplify our system. And that's exactly what they've done. Now, it's time we adopt these changes, removing one more barrier to economic growth and making Arizona even more competitive. While we take these important steps to boost our economy, we can't forget the most fundamental and lasting key to Arizona's competitiveness, our schools. To enable our schools to keep pace with global competition, we're raising standards and increasing accountability for students, schools, and teachers. Everyone knows that global competition for jobs has changed. Our schools must keep pace. Our new Common Core standards are benchmarked to the top education measures in the world. If Arizona schools aren't doing the job, we'll know about it, and so will the parents. Of course, it's not enough to install a new curriculum, raise standards, and hope for the best. I'm committed to helping schools and teachers make this transition a success. You will see that reflected in the detailed budget I released on Friday. And that brings us to school funding. Whatever your point of view, we should all agree that it's time we start funding the academic results we want to see. What I am proposing is the nation's first comprehensive performance funding plan for our district and charter schools. This plan will reward schools that earn high marks or see real improvement 
in performance. I'm not talking about scrapping attendance-based funding formulas. Rather, this will augment that system with an innovative approach to promoting school performance while maintaining local control. Together, let's stop simply funding the system we have and start funding the student achievement we want. And you all understand how important this is. Our private universities located in the West Valley are expanding and providing new opportunities for our students. Grand Canyon University has grown by epic proportions and its athletic program has just joined the Western Athletic Conference as a Division I school. Prime University has added a school of engineering and will soon open the first veterinarian school in the state of Arizona at Midwestern University. These are all great accomplishments, but we have to ensure that our students have the skills to be successful in these programs. Arizona's future is also tied to another critical decision. It's a decision some would prefer not to face. They'd like to wish it away, and we cannot. Nor can we simply wag our finger at the federal government. <laughs> Trust me, I tried it once. <laughs> and of course, I'm speaking about Arizona's Medicaid program and expanded coverage with the accordance with the Affordable Care Act. Like many of you, I oppose the president's health care plan. That's why, after weighing the pros and cons of Obamacare health exchange, I opted against Arizona's participation. I also led Arizona in joining a coalition of states that sought to block the program in court. I have taken every opportunity to argue for health reform with less bureaucracy, more patient choice, and fewer costs. Try as we might, the law was upheld by the United States Supreme Court. The president was reelected, and his party controls the United States Senate. In short, the Affordable Care Act isn't going anywhere, at least not for the time being. By agreeing to expand our Medicaid program to slightly beyond what Arizona voters have twice mandated, we will protect rural and safety net hospitals from being pushed to the brink by their growing costs in caring for the uninsured. Take advantage of the enormous economic benefits, inject $2 billion into our economy, save and create thousands of jobs, and provide health care to hundreds of thousands of low-income Arizonans. Saying no to this plan would not save these federal dollars from being spent or direct them to the deficit reduction. No, Arizona's tax dollars would simply be passed to another state, generating jobs and providing health care for citizens in California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, or any other expansion state. Remember, Arizona's citizens have voted twice to expand Medicaid coverage. With this move, we will secure a federal revenue stream to cover the cost of the uninsured who already show up in our doctor's offices and emergency rooms. Under the current system, these costs are passed along to Arizona families. Health care premiums are raised year after year to account for expenses incurred by our hospitals as they provide care for the uninsured. This amounts to a hidden tax estimated at nearly $2,000 per family per year. As I weighed this decision, I was troubled by the possibility that a future president in Congress may take steps to reduce federal matching rates, leaving states with a greater and greater share of the health costs over time. And I worried that any expansion of Medicaid, no matter the federal subsidies, could result in costs the state cannot afford. Together with my team, I've created and crafted a plan to address both of these concerns and safeguard Arizona. First, any expansion of our Medicaid program will include a circuit breaker that automatically 
rolled back enrollment if federal reimbursement rates decrease. I won't allow Obamacare to become a bait and switch. Second, we will allow hospitals and health providers to assess a fee upon themselves using that revenue to leverage federal assistance. This is already done in 47 states. It's also ongoing in the city of Phoenix and under consideration in other cities across Arizona. With this federal revenue, this hospital assessment generates, we can assure that our state general fund bears no cost in expanding Medicaid. That doesn't mean it's free money, of course. We know there is no such thing. I'm as much of a federal deficit hawk as anywhere, anyone in this room. But Arizona's Medicaid program access is not the problem. It is, in fact, part of the solution as the nationally recognized gold standard for cost-effective managed care in this country. I'll be releasing more details about my Medicaid plan in the days ahead. Weigh the evidence and do the math. With the realities facing us, taking advantage of this federal assistance in a strategic way to reduce Medicaid pressure on the state budget, we can prevent health care expenses from eroding core services such as education and public safety and improve Arizona's ability to compete in the years ahead. Having said all this, I know passage of my Medicaid plan isn't going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of hard work to reach some lawmakers. I ask you, all of you, to join me in this effort. Contact your legislator. Let them know how important this is to you and your family and your business. We can do this, but we can only do it together. Arizona's challenges are great, but not greater than our capacity to meet them. This is Arizona's legacy. We were the last of the continental states, carved from rugged country, a territorial landscape equally harsh and beautiful. And if Arizona truly intends to compete, we should study the meaning of the word. And this might surprise you, but the word compete is of Latin root. It means to strive together. Our forefathers built this state for us with a shared purpose and a common cause. We can secure the future only through that same spirit. Let us not squander the many blessings we've inherited. Let us leave a legacy of our own as we make the difficult decisions that keep Arizona on the path to prosperity. It is a legacy, I pray, that will be worthy of this wonderful place that I love. I am filled with optimism. It's the kind that comes with knowing our cause is just and our course is true. I know that Arizona's best days are yet to come. God bless you, God bless America, and God bless the great state of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you very much.